This story takes place in 1940. To give it more context, it was right at the start of the war. Sunday, the 8th of September 1940, starts with a boy called Marcel Ravidat, nicknamed the convict, who with his friends discovered the entrance to the Lascaux cave. On this day, he had gone after his dog, who had chased a fox or a rabbit, when he kicked a stone with his foot, and it tumbled down into this little hole and made an echo that brought everyone running. And so the little group gathered around the hole and immediately thought back to the legend that had been told for generations, a story of an underground passage that was said to exist between the Montagnac Castle and a manor house just at the foot of the hill, known as the Lascaux Manor. Anyway, they were not able to explore it that day because they didn't have a torch. They left, saying, we'll see later, but we need to go back and explore this famous underground passage. Four days later, Marcel Ravidat fashioned himself a torch and a knife, but none of his friends wanted to come along. On the way, he met three other boys from the village, Jacques Marsal, George Agnel, and Simon Quancas. So, he convinced them to come with him. And so it was these four who simply unblocked the entrance. It took them a good hour to do it, because they couldn't get through at all. By clearing the entrance, it was Ravidat who succeeded in making his way in head first. And all four began exploring the first hall little by little. So, the first painting that they saw was the red cow with the black head that is to the left at the entrance of the Axial Gallery. Then, they began making discovery after discovery on the walls. A bull here, a horse there, a line of deer, and so on. The initial shock for them was aesthetic. Then, there was a second shock that I refer to as a mystical or cultural shock. What was it? They didn't know. On the other hand, the images spoke to them. There were bulls, horses, deer, animals that they recognized. But they had no idea of the age or why they were there. So they tried to keep the cave a secret. Their idea was to tell their old teacher, Leon Laval, who immediately recognized the site as prehistoric. Laval said they had to speak to Abbé Breuil, who was the greatest expert in prehistory of the era. On the 22nd of September, barely nine days after the discovery, they were lucky enough to have the cave authenticated by Abbé Breuil. In the ensuing hubbub, crowds of journalists arrived to make it national and even international news. Of course, a little video there on the Lascaux Cave Discovery, uh, which was found in France in 1940, uh, of course, depicting a lot of early human cave art uh, and all that. So anyway, I want to welcome you back, of course, to uh, History 1113, of course, summer edition. Uh, of course, we're talking about prehistory today. Uh, looks like I've got a lot of students uh, that are basically on, looks like watching, I got a lot of students watching right now, looks like it. So we got Tonica. Hey, what's going on? Hope you're having a great morning over there over, overall. Natalie, uh, hope you're having a great morning. <clears throat> Ashley, I think it's Ashley. What's going on? Not sure a little top videos is, but <laughs> maybe let me know. Uh, <clears throat> Madison, good morning. Hey, Madison. Trey, what's going on? Uh, Jessica, having a great time out there. Naira, Nat, hope you're having a great morning overall. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, Whitney. Of course, I see that. Uh, uh, Morrison. Uh, we got Meg also is watching. It's like Jessica. Okay, yeah. Okay, I got that. Gavin. Hey, hope you're having a great morning uh, overall. <clears throat> Nadia, of course, Natalie also as well. It looks like Richard uh, is, of course, on. Uh, he's in uh, StreamYard right now. Good morning. Hope you're doing great out there uh, overall. Uh, if anybody, of course, wants to join me uh, in uh, StreamYard, uh, i got the link, of course, right here. I can give you right here, which is, of course, that, there it is right there, StreamYard.com, uh, of course, if you want to join me uh, today. So, anyway, I hope everybody's doing having a great week out there uh, overall. Um, you know, I think if you miss it yesterday, you can kind of go back, of course, and look at my uh, little, you know, kind of went over the syllabus yesterday in the course uh, for History 11.13. So uh, that's still up, of course, on my YouTube channel and pretty much will be up there uh, throughout the whole, you know, entire semester for you to look at. 
So uh, just kind of a reminder about a few things, of course, uh, coming up. Uh, I think I, I've got some, I know some basic stuff you need to work on right now. Uh, the pre-test, I think, is due Friday. So you got two, three more days on that left. Uh, also, the contract policy page needs to be done by also Friday as well. So I'm trying to get that uh, deadline there uh, for that. Uh, also today, uh, there will be, of course, a quiz on this lecture today on prehistory, quiz number one, uh, which that'll pretty much be up already today right now. Uh, if you want to, of course, work on after, of course, this lecture today. So yeah, I'm live streaming. And of course, it will be, of course, you can see it later uh, on my YouTube channel uh, overall. So if you have any, like I said, if you got any comments, uh, questions, you know, during the you know broadcast or whatever, uh, you can, of course, ask me anytime you want. Uh, or, of course, later, you know, you can also send comments, you know, comments, questions later, of course, which you do get bonus points also, of course, for that. Oh, well, you like the background. Yeah, it is a pretty good background. Uh, that, of course, is the Lasco cave behind me, some of the images of it uh, that you're, of course, looking at in that little short video uh, right there. So anyway, like I said, today uh, we're going to, of course, be talking about, uh, you know, prehistory. We're going to mostly talk about the development of early humans, uh, like in prehistoric times. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint lecture that I do have. Of course, you may have looked at already. I might have revised it a little bit, which I'll kind of put up later for you uh, that I've got. Uh, but I'll kind of, I'll go more into like the, some of these caves, of course, that they have later uh, overall. But I first want to uh, talk a little bit of background today about, you know, like the background of history. That's, I guess, one of the first things that I usually do uh, before we really get started, uh, more or less. Uh, some of these slides you can kind of look at later, of course, and I'm kind of going through uh, which are right here. But I'll first talk about <clears throat> like the background of history first. I'll do that. And then I'll kind of talk about what they call prehistory, which is, you know, obviously a little different from that. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, the first thing I, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about uh, today <clears throat> is Herodotus. You may have heard about uh, before. And um, yeah, like what exactly is history? I and mean, of course, if you know about Herodotus, Herodotus, of course, was one of the fathers of history. He's the one who started, you know, a long time ago, almost 2,500 years ago, roughly. Uh, and um, uh, at least for us, history is like the uh, like a kind of a history of like world civilization. So that's mostly what this class is really going to be about. I'm going to cover, you know, mostly human civilizations. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> but um, I'll talk about Herodotus, who he was. Herodotus was, the, of course, the they often call him a Herodotus of Halicarnassus. You may have heard of that name, his full name. Uh, he was actually from Western Turkey, and he lived about the 5th century B.C. Uh, he's known as the father of history, uh, and um, he's really the first historian that really, you know, starts to kind of chronicalize some kind of history of, you know, humankind at the time. And uh, predominantly his books are usually called different names, like the histories of Herodotus. Uh, some people call it the, um, I think the history of the Persian Wars is another name. They sometimes call him as well. And he wrote like a history of like the wars between like um, Persian Empire and Greece. And he also gave us an early history of like ancient Egypt and things like that. So uh, he's really uh, considered one of the first historians that kind of starts what they call uh, historiography, uh, which is like the writing, the writing of history, uh, as they as they also call it uh, as well. Hey, Devin. Devin's coming in, of course, in the stream yard uh, as well. Um, so um. So, yeah, you got the background of history. Oh, and by the way, the word history, I'll put it on the screen for you. The word history, it means to inquiry. That's actually what it translates as meaning. So uh, inquiry is meaning like they're trying to, uh, I guess, rediscover, study about the past. Uh, it's kind of what it can translate as meaning to investigate or to, to know about the past. I think it's another translation uh, of it as well. Yeah, David, hey, good morning. Uh, you're doing great out there uh, overall. Uh, looks like uh, Shane's joining us also as well. I hope you're having a great morning uh, also uh, out there as well. So, yeah, we're talking about uh, like the background of history, Herodotus, you know, the so-called father of history. Uh, he's not the best. Uh, I don't know if you know much about Herodotus. He's not the greatest of the Greek historians. 
Um, I think Thucydides is pretty good. I know Plutarch is another writer we'll talk about later. Uh, he's also pretty good. Uh, a lot of the early historians like Herodotus were prone to exaggeration, even using some mythologies on things like that. I think it was Voltaire that remarked that Herodotus was sometimes called the father of lies because we're not sure if he's really telling the truth or not. Because uh, I think everything was like he didn't have all the information sometimes to write history and sometimes he would exaggerate or something would think make stuff up. That's kind of a debate about that. Uh, but he's the guy that kind of influenced other people to, you know, write history like the Greeks and the Romans. And Cicero, you know, about this, a famous Roman was the one who called him father of history and all that. So anyway, that's like the Greeks and, you know, how they kind of start writing history. But, you know, history kind of goes back further. You know, you, you can go back to like that that cave painting I had behind me, right? That I was showing you earlier, uh, which you see there. That's like almost like a form of history right there. That you have people, you know, chronicalizing hunting of various animals, uh, things like that. Uh, early forms of like oral history is a form of history. Uh, poetry, like epic poems and things like that uh, are forms of history also as well. Okay. Um, let me say anyway, um, but um, so yeah, that, that's a good form, you know, like poetry and things like that as well. I was going to mark about one more thing. Uh, all oh, biblical stories, I guess you can say, are also kind of like a form of history uh, also as well. So those are all kinds of different forms of history uh, overall. Now I'm going to, of course, move on to also talk about uh, what they call, um, I'll get to it also as well. We'll talk about Herodotus. We talked about him. Uh, I'll also talk about what they call prehistory uh, as well. Prehistory. Uh, what is that? Uh, what exactly is uh, prehistory? Well, prehistory is like the period before, you know, like human history. Uh, so prehistoric times would be uh, like uh, starting like around the Stone Age and going back toward the beginning of the Earth. That would be like what we call prehistory uh, pretty much. Uh, the word prehistory means basically um, the period before history. Uh, you know, was what it is. I think pre means before. So before written history or before civilization would be a translation, I guess, of what it basically means. And uh, prehistory relies heavily on um, a lot of the scientific fields. So paleontology, you know, the study like, you know, the earth and minerals and things like, actually of, of bones, mostly artifacts and things like that from a long time ago. Uh, geology is the one that studies the earth and minerals and things like that. Uh, anthropology, like human culture and things like that. Uh, archaeology, which is a branch of anthropology, also or also as well. Uh, and um, why don't you all keep trying to come back in? I know. Just try to stay in if you can. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, try to stop going in and out for me if you don't mind. But uh, anyway, but yeah, those are some of the fields that, you know, like mostly – early humans basically are working on. Yeah, I kept losing connection, I know. I am, I am streaming in 1080 pixels, so it kind of might be harder in StreamYard because of that. But um, so, yeah, prehistory, uh, I'm going to get, of course, in today and talk about primarily like early humans uh, that developed. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and really talk about uh, predominantly some of the early humans that first developed uh, which will kind of go in, I won't go into all of them, but I'll get into uh, some of the ones that were, uh, of course, well known that you may have heard of today, like Australopithecus. Of course, that's one you may have heard of, like Lucy, like sometimes they call it for nickname for short. Um, also, uh, Homo habilis, we'll talk about that early human as well, uh, which is the one on the bottom left. Now, there's Lucy right there, like, uh, like an early. Australopithecus uh, hominid uh, fossil, of course, right there. Homo habilis, uh, you got, uh, of course, Homo erectus, which is right here in the middle. Uh, Neanderthal humans, uh, which are like early archaic humans right there. And, of course, you got your Cro-Magnum man, which is also uh, right there. So these are all various uh, early humans that uh, have been found, like, in the fossil record going back to um, – like parts of parts of Africa, uh, which I don't know if you know much about Africa. Uh, they think that early humans 
uh, developed in Africa like millions of years ago. Uh, like, I don't know, there's kind of debate about how far back it goes. Uh, some say seven, eight million. Some claim even further back than that, like 15, 20, 20 million years ago as well. And Africa is often known as the cradle of humankind. That's where uh, first humans kind of start kind of developing uh, early culture, uh, especially that East East Africa. East Africa is one of the main areas where, you know, humans are basically developing uh, initially. Uh, and um, a lot of the early humans, are, uh, like especially the ancestors, are known as hominins, if you know about that. Uh, these are the ones that are, I guess, extinct and the ones that are still around, of course, today. Uh, and um, I'll kind of, like I said, I'm going to go through and talk about some of these early humans that were, of course, well known uh, early on. And um, there's a list of them. You want them again, all right? The Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. Uh, I don't have like uh, there's one called Homo uh, neanderthalensis. Uh, yeah, Homo Homo. Yeah, Homo uh, Neanderth uh, neanderthal man. Homo uh, neanderthal lenses. I think how they say it actually. Uh, there's also Heidelberg man. I don't know if you've heard of that one. I might mention him as well. Uh, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens. That's just us today. We're, we're modern humans. They call them Homo sapiens sapiens, of course, today, overall. Uh, looks like Helena's joined us. Like, uh, hey, what's going on? I guess Helena, as they say it. But um, anyway, um, or Helena, I guess Helena, I guess they say it. But anyway, um, so. I'm going to first talk about the one that they usually uh, discuss the most uh, early on. I think I do got an image. Oh, here's an image, by the way, showing later the map of like Homo sapiens. Of course, over time, you know, like I say, humans first develop in Africa. Uh, you can see from this map. And then over time, they start migrating uh, Africa into Asia and Europe. Uh, then, of course, obviously into uh, like where Australia is and all that. And then eventually into the Americas. So this takes over, you know, thousands of years that, you know, humans and early humans, uh, of course, migrate uh, throughout these regions uh, right there. Uh, one of the first humans they always talk about uh, that I usually mention about is uh, Australopithecus, uh, of course, which uh, one of the first ones discovered was uh, the one that was called Lucy, you've heard about. Uh, and uh, it was a famous um, early human fossil uh, that was found in e northern Ethiopia uh, by Dr. Uh, Donald Johansson around 1974. And uh, it was believed to be some kind of early human uh, that they think uh, that may have been one of the first that broke away from like non-human primates. Uh, and they think she was like a 12-year-old female that had, I think, fallen out of a tree or something like that and died. And somehow like, her remains were found. I think like maybe 40% of her remains were actually found. Uh, and um, oh, why they call her Lucy? Uh, I think you know about the famous story about this. There was a song being played on the radio that day or that when they found her, uh, which was um, Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds by the Beatles, the famous you know, pop group you may have heard of back in the 60s. Uh, and uh, so that, that's why well, I don't know if they even knew it was a, I guess they did kind of know it was a girl maybe from the, femur and all that, but uh, in the, I guess the hip area, but uh, that was considered like the first really, you know, early, early human. And I think they say she was about the size of a chimpanzee. Like you look at images of Lucy uh, right here. Uh, they think she was like maybe three foot six. So three to four feet tall was about the height of Lucy. And I think the brain size was a little larger than a chimpanzee's, uh, they think. Uh, so early, early variations of you know, pre-humans or whatever uh, were obviously much smaller, although she's obviously a child. So, you know, maybe a full adult that's maybe around 20 or whatever, obviously would be much taller, or whatever, four feet, four or five feet tall, right? Uh, basically or more. So um, a lot of the early humans, they think, lived in trees uh, and were probably plant eaters. So. Uh, I don't think they ate meat yet, as far as they know, uh, with these early pre-humans or whatever uh, that they talk about. Uh, now, the one they always discuss uh, also as well is um, Homo habilis. Of course, you may have heard of this early human uh, that's well known. 
Uh, they were first discovered like, well, they really go back to, I think I want to say the 1960s is about when uh, they think, I, I think the original, I think some of the early ones were found by uh, this man named Louis Leakey. I don't even hear the Leakey family and all that. The Leakeys were famous um, paleontologists. Uh, they were well known, especially in like uh, dealing with paleoanthropology uh, and all that. And uh, the Leakeys um, were kind of like pioneers in a lot of the um, research and the origins of early humans in East Africa. Uh, and Tanzania is like one of the first spots, I think, where they discover, of course, a lot of these early, you know, humans that they have. And uh, Homo habilis was uh, called handyman. Some say skilled man, if you want, uh, as well. But it was called handyman because of the fact that they used like early types of stone tools, which I think the early tools were part of a tool industry that was called Oldowan, uh, which um, they made these like uh, types of like stone tools where they would strike them against rocks or pebbles. And so uh, they were called pebble choppers, I think was one variations that they would call them. And uh, of course they were one of the first to eat meat, uh, as you know. Uh, and um, so from there, you know, humans began to get, you know, larger in size. Uh, I believe the average homo, homo uh, hobilis, um is definitely over five feet, close to five feet tall. Uh, it would be about the height. Uh, brain size is uh, much larger, of course, than a chimpanzee as well. Of course, one thing that's, of course, famous about homo hobilis, which you can if you go back to that picture I had earlier uh, showing uh, the image of homo hobilis, uh, which the one is right here. You can see also it's got those heavy brow ridges. It's something you start to see a lot uh, in a lot of humans, uh, even up to modern times, like above the eye socket uh, and all that. So you see those kind of things, you know, changing, you know, with, with early, it's like, you know, I, I guess that calls by you know, larger brain sizes and, and things like that. Uh, you start seeing <clears throat> more or less. Uh, they think that the Homo habilis, like early early type humans, date back as far as maybe, I'd say about two and a half million years ago uh, at the most. So they do go back pretty far. Most of them lived throughout parts of Africa, especially at East Africa, anywhere from like, I want to say Ethiopia, Kenya area, all the way down to like South Africa. Uh, they found like various, you know, skeletal remains of some of these early humans. Now, there's one that's more famous, uh, really, than uh, Homo habilis that came next. I don't really have a slide on that one, but uh, they have what they call Homo erectus, you may have heard of. Uh, Homo erectus uh, is a, a early, early human. It means an upright man. Let's use the translation of it. Uh, this is, of course, an early uh, archaic human uh, that went back, they think, one to two million years ago, uh, lived and uh, they were considered one of the first humans that walked upright, you know, bipedal, like on two feet. Uh, and uh, they were considered, by the way, one, some of the first uh, major humans that were like big hunters, like hunter-gatherers uh, that, that hunted, you know, big game and things like that. Uh, they were the ones who really started it uh, in the Stone Age. And uh, they believe that Homo erectus is also the, uh, some of the early archaic humans that uh, began to migrate like from Africa into different parts of Asia. So uh, they, they date as far back as 2 million, but I think they say there's some evidence of early, you know, early, these early humans going back to about 250,000 years ago uh, as a culture. They start migrating, I think, into Asia first and then uh, into also Europe uh, as well. Uh, they were they were known for a lot of different kinds of um, type of uh, tools. That's one thing I guess that Homo erectus is very famous for is their advancement with like technologies in general. Of course, the most famous thing you know that the supposed Homo Homo erectus developed was the famous uh, stone hand axe that you may have heard about, which was part of a tool industry called Achillean, which was named after I think a city in, in what is France, I think today. Uh, and um, where they, I think, start some of the first of these uh, stone tools uh, from a long time ago. Uh, of course, use of fire, something that starts to be kind of used, which may be used that to cook food, you know, uh, obviously keep warm and keep wild animals away, uh, things like that. 
I think they think you see they lived in caves and early kinds of types of um, huts. I think they lived in. And uh, also the throwing spear, you may have heard of that. That kind of starts to kind of come around uh, as well. The addle addle, they call it too as well. I think later throwing spear, which was used to hunt animals uh, also as well. Uh, there's been a lot of different examples of like uh, early uh, Homo erectus that have been found, like foss fossils. And of course, the one that you see there uh, in that picture uh, is considered to be uh, the, one of the most famous, which is Turkana boy <clears throat> that was found by Richard Leakey, 1984, uh, near what is Lake Rudolph. Um, I think it's like kind of between uh, what is, well, it used to be called Lake Rudolph. They now call it Lake Turkana. I think they changed the name later. But uh, it's actually between like uh, the border between uh, Kenya and uh, Ethiopia. Richard Leakey is one of the sons of um, Lewis and Mary Leakey. He's had a lot of discoveries as well with his mother and father. Uh, and uh, that one supposedly, Turkana boy, is one of the most intact um, Homo erectus uh, skeleton ever found. I think he was about five foot three, uh, they estimate, uh, Turkana boy. So obviously this was a boy of some type. I think a young man, I think they discovered. So some of these, obviously, these uh, earlier humans could have been that taller, taller, more than that. I think 1984, I think, is when he found it. Uh, they had some other ones you may have heard of. There's one they think they went back to the, uh, they think as far back as the late 1800s, there was a man named uh, Eugene Du Bois, you may have heard of him, who discovered uh, some kind of early human that was, they think, also like a Homo erectus, uh, which was on the island of Java, uh, which is close to Indonesia uh, in the Pacific Ocean. So they think that these early humans had boats. And they were able to kind of, maybe sail across parts into the Pacific and things like that. Uh, in, in, uh, in China, they also discovered some other like skeletal remains that I think date, I want to say not quite a million, but maybe 7, 800,000 800, years ago, uh, Peking Man, I think they called it, uh, which was discovered like in the Yellow River Valley, close to where Beijing is, uh, close to like the 1930s uh, and all that. So obviously these humans were spreading out uh, through different parts of Asia, I think also in Europe uh, as well. Uh, so they think Homo erectus is somehow like an early ancestor of later humans that come in. Uh, now, how they're related, that's kind of a debate today, uh, you know, because they talk about some of these humans being like an evolution from one to the another, or the other one they talk about, they might be different subspecies of humans. So there may have been more than one human of species that were around uh, at one point. Uh, now, one of the ones that's, of course, very famous, you, you've probably heard about, of course, with early humans, uh, is the, um, of course, Neanderthal man, uh, which I've got a skull of, uh, which is right there. Uh, Neanderthal humans, um, of course, you know much about them. Uh, they're called different names. I think the common name of, of uh, Neanderthal man is Homo neanderthalensis. Uh, and by the way, I do have a uh, short video I'll show, of course, on Neanderthal humans. Got to get more into it. Uh, but they are quite different from later humans. So they think definitely some kind of subspecies maybe of, of humans that were later. Neanderthals are often depicted as brutish cavemen. But science shows that our early ancestors were actually quite advanced. Neanderthals, or Homo neanderthalensis, are our closest relatives in the human family tree. The species lived from about 400,000 to 40,000 years ago and inhabited an area that stretched as far west as Europe's Atlantic coast and as far east as Central Asia. Their habitat reached northward to modern-day Belgium, making them the first humans to survive a cold glacial ecosystem. The North's cold environment may have influenced Neanderthals' physique. Their bodies were relatively short, with males averaging 5 feet 5 inches and females 5 feet 1 inch tall. And they were stocky, with broad chests, bulky torsos, and muscular limbs. These adaptations helped Neanderthals generate and retain body heat. Also, 
their noses were large and had relatively high bridges. This created a nasal chamber that warmed and humidified the cold, dry air they'd breathe in northern regions. Apart from adaptations that helped Neanderthals survive a harsh, wintry habitat, the species also developed large brains. They were similar in size to modern humans' brains and were often larger. An increase in brain size may have played a significant role in another type of adaptation, culture. Culture is indicative of an intelligent species, and archaeological evidence suggests that Neanderthals had a relatively sophisticated culture. They built shelters, made and wore clothing, and created advanced tools. In fact, they were the first human species to make tools out of bone, not just stone. They also created objects that served ornamental purposes. Neanderthals are suspected to be the first humans to carry out the symbolic gesture of burying their dead and adorning gravesites with flowers. Neanderthals may have also created what may be the world's oldest cave art which was found in Spain. Despite advances in their culture, sometime after 40,000 years ago, Neanderthals mysteriously disappeared. Some scientists believe the Neanderthals were killed or outcompeted by modern humans, or Homo sapiens, who arrived in Europe at around the same time as the Neanderthals' extinction. However, another theory suggests that Neanderthals mated with modern humans and were absorbed into the humans' much larger population. That may explain why most people of European or Asian descent have 1-2% to Neanderthal genes in their DNA. For more than 150 years, Neanderthals have perplexed anthropologists. The first Neanderthal fossil specimen was discovered in Belgium in 1829 by Philippe Charles Schmerling. However, it wasn't officially classified as Neanderthal until decades later. The first fossil to be recognized as Neanderthal and as an early human or genus Homo fossil was found in 1856 by Quarrimen in Germany. The new species was named Neanderthalensis after the area where the fossils were found, Neander Valley. Neanderthal's fossils tell us how evolution built them to be sturdy to survive their harsh environment. But their tools, art, and DNA tell us that their resilience also involved innovation, creativity, and social behavior, much like Homo sapiens today. So it's like little cousins of us, basically, uh, Neanderthal humans, of course, uh, compared to, like, say, later humans. So anyway, yeah, so, yeah, you got your, uh, of course, your Neanderthal humans that you have, which you can see, obviously, they are more stocky uh, compared to, you know, later humans that were more skinnier uh, in frame. And um, they were known for um, a type of um, – a stone tool industry called Mousterian. And you've heard about this before. Uh, it's like a type of um, tool, uh, stone tools that are made of flint. They want to start using flint and things like that. So you know what the term flintstones kind of comes from, I guess, uh, from that. Uh, they were known for like living in caves. So they, they have some primitive forms of early cave art uh, that's being done, I guess, before later humans, of course. Uh, that would, of course, you know, have them that. And um, that's the full name, Homo Neanderthal lensis, I think is usually what they call them, or Neanderthal man, uh, which most of them lived in Europe, uh, parts of southwestern Asia. Uh, they think they may have lived in parts of North Africa, like briefly, uh, also as well. Uh, and, uh, of course, they talked about the fact that they were first found in Neanderthal Valley, uh, which is in Germany, uh, hence the name, of course, being used uh, later. But... Uh, they do think that, um, you know, the uh, these humans eventually went extinct. Uh, of course, there's been different theories on, you know, why they went extinct. Uh, I think they just kind of were, you know, outclassed by other humans that also migrated out of Africa uh, that were just, you know, better than they were uh, and um, maybe outnumbered them. I think they do talk about the fact that the Neanderthal humans uh, lived in smaller clans. Uh, compared to later humans that came in. And, of course, the ones we're talking about uh, are 
uh, homo sapiens, which means um, wise man. It's what usually translates as meaning. And that's usually the term that they use for the ancestors of humans that maybe date back, you know, several hundred thousand years ago, possibly. I think they think that early humans may have started as far back in Africa originally before they began to migrate uh, into Europe uh, and uh, what is parts of Asia. Uh, and um, Cro-Magnum humans, uh, they talk about, <clears throat> which uh, here's a, now here's, by the way, also a difference between the two skulls. I didn't really show you that as well, but you can see a difference between like later humans on the left, like Cro-Magnums and other humans that come later uh, versus the, you know, Neanderthal skull on the right. And you can see how they had that, you know, heavy brow ridges uh, above the eye socket, uh, receding forehead, much larger, uh, by the way, jawbone uh, compared to uh, like later humans. They're big meat eaters, uh, you know, uh, Neanderthal humans. Uh, and, uh, you know, because of the warm climate, obviously that affected their physique and their skull. Well, they think also that earlier humans may have had more uh, testosterone as well, which may have also played some kind of reason for why their face looks different compared to later humans, which are more smoother, as you know. Um, but yeah, your Cro-Magnum uh, skull, uh, I think I've got one right here, uh, right there. Cro-Magnum humans were a type of um, human culture uh, that was mostly in Europe, like in Europe and maybe part of Western Asia as well, maybe part of North Africa as well, but mostly in parts of Europe is where they are. Uh, date anywhere from like 40 to 50,000 years ago uh, is where this culture kind of begins. Uh, and um, they were known for pr primarily living throughout like an ice age. Like, so it was a colder climate uh, at the time. So a lot of them lived in caves. Uh, as you know, you saw that I think that little short video I showed you on the uh, so-called, like the Lasco cave, uh, which is uh, near Montanac, uh, France. Uh, and um, actually there was a cave called the Cro Magnum cave that they found in 1868 uh, in France uh, as well, uh, where it's where that got the name from. So that's where the term Cro Magnum came from, from a cave they found. I think that one also depicted some art, but the, Lasco Cave was, I think, considered the one that was the most famous one uh, they discovered in France uh, at the beginning of World War II. I think the Germans had just had invaded France at the time, you know, Hitler, uh, and uh, the discovery was made. And of course, I mean, as a very, like, you saw a little short video about how this, this boy and his dog named Robot, you know, found it. Uh, and of course, they found all these different images in the cave. And uh, it used to be open to the public until 1960s, but because of all the you know, human activity in there, it had an effect on the paintings. And so uh, they had to close close the cave down. So nobody can go in it anymore. Uh, they did, did build a replica cave uh, of it now that they have. And they also have a big museum for it as well, depicting a lot of different cave art that was actually in it. I think they say that a lot of these caves... Um, a lot of the cave art was actually done, you're looking at, was done in the upper Paleolithic age, which I'll kind of explain that period a little later. That's kind of the period right before the old, uh, the new Stone Age, uh, which comes in. But that's when a lot of humans are doing a lot of this cave art, uh, more or less. But uh, they do think that uh, Neanderthal humans may have had some early cave art as well, but not as advanced as some of this was. Now, I want to also get into uh, and uh, talk about uh, as well. I want to I discuss uh, the different historical periods uh, that exist. I think I've got it right here, but uh, they, they usually break uh, like um, cultural stages of human development into different like periods. Uh, I kind of want to get into that uh, today. Uh, usually uh, like the Stone Age is, as you know, um, which is like two, three million years old, uh, roughly. They usually break into sub periods. So you've got like your so-called Paleolithic Age, uh, your Mesolithic Age, and you have the Neolithic Age, uh, which uh, if you want the translation of it, uh, Old Stone Age, uh, Middle Stone Age, uh, and New Stone Age. Uh, just those are kind of Greek names they use. Uh, I think it developed in the 1800s, these kind of you know, names to describe the different periods uh, in early human history. Uh, and... Um, 
you can see here that um, the the old Stone Age, uh, which is the oldest part of it, goes back the furthest. So it goes like into the um, so-called Pleistocene epoch, you may have heard of back then, which um, covers about two and a half billion years ago or so. So it goes down like roughly about 10,000 BC maybe. Uh, so during that stage, a lot of your early humans like, you know, Homo erectus and Neanderthal humans and uh, I guess going down to like Cro-Magnum man and things like that. Uh, most of their main culture of how they survived was predominantly through like the hunting and gathering. So it's the main way humans, you know, uh, survive, uh, whether living in caves or huts or whatever at the time, primitive huts uh, at the time. And so they rely a lot on stone type tools. Uh, it's like the main kind of, you know, I guess thing they use for technology weapons and tools and things like that uh, overall. Uh, there's like a period between it called the Mesolithic Age. You can see there it's a transitional period between the Paleolithic Age and the Neolithic Age, where you start seeing humans uh, at that time starting to move towards farming. So they go from like hunting and gathering to farming, which I think they did it at the same time initially. And then over time, humans began to farm more than, you know, hunt. Uh, basically, so yeah, you got you got you know you got the that the old Stone Age first, you know, which is mostly in the Pleistocene, uh, which was like like mostly an Ice Age, of course, in the world, and then like the Mesolithic period, like the Middle Stone Age, is more like a period where the Earth is starting to warm up. Uh, you start to see like the receding Ice Age, last glacial period kind of comes in uh, at that time, and you get the so-called Holocene epoch you may have heard about, uh, which started maybe about 11, 12,000 years ago, uh, not quite, somewhere between nine and 10,000 BC, I think. So I think it started actually. That's the current geological epoch that the earth is in right now, uh, which is a more of a warming period. Some people think it's inter interglacial period, like between ice ages maybe or something like that. Uh, but from there, then humans uh, during the new stone age, uh, you see on the bottom, 10,000 to 3,000 circa about, uh, you get this deal where humans began to rely more on farming, like agriculture, uh, the domestication of animals or animal, animal husbandry, or uh, I think they call it different names. But um, so you see, you see humans, you know, having this cultural revolution uh, where they go from, uh, you know, hunting and to basically farming. And uh, yeah, uh, agriculture is the Neolithic revolution that really begins and leads to, you know, urbanization where, you know, humans start creating villages, they start creating cities uh, and things like that. Uh, and so sometime like roughly, you know, at the beginning of the Neolithic period, you start seeing people farming, farming and having villages and things like that uh, overall. So you see other advancements too, like, you know, you start to see the development of early language, uh, pottery uh, being used a lot. Uh, I think the wheel will probably come in there eventually. Uh, new kinds of weapons are introduced. I think harpoon and fishing are you know, some things that they also do uh, as well. So all kinds of new advancements start coming in, you know, roughly by the time we go into the new stone age. Even early metals, like the, I'll get to copper in a second, but copper is something they start experimenting with uh, before bronze would come in. Uh, oh, also they've got the so-called metal ages, which um, they really they usually have just bronze and iron, but there was actually, believe it or not, there was a copper age, believe it or not, uh, which I think started at the end of the new at the end of the new stone age. There's like a copper age, which it's sometimes called the Chalcolithic Age, which Chalcolithic means um, Copper Stone Age. I think he used that term. Uh, so you got a Copper Age, uh, then there's a Bronze Age, uh, then they have an Iron Age. Uh, and so they kind of sometimes break the Metal Ages down into different sub-periods. But really, Bronze and Iron are the two main periods that they talk about. It's kind of a debate about when the Bronze Age starts, but they think it starts around 3000 BC and goes down to about maybe 1200 BC. So it's around 2000 years uh, that humans start using bronze, which, you know, bronze is like copper mixed with some tin, like maybe 20% or so. Uh, the Iron Age starts maybe around 1200 BC and goes up to like, you know, Roman times and all that. 
Uh, so I think the Iron I think the Iron Age usually starts or ends. Yeah, 1200 BC it ends of usually about 580 is about I think when they usually put it at or something like that. Then you got the Middle Ages that falls later uh, after that. Uh, sometimes, uh, by the way, they sometimes take the Stone Age uh, and the Bronze Age and also the Iron Age. They kind of put it together because those are like really the three main periods where humans really uh, have the most advancement, of course. So-called three age system, they dub it, by the way. Uh, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron. So you got Stone, Bronze, Iron uh, that you have right there. Uh, and But you have all these sub-periods uh, that they have as well. But um, I'm going to also talk about today, I'll kind of get into as well uh, and discuss some of the different, um, as you know, they had like early types of villages uh, that came about later, uh, which um, here's not a slide there. But on the bottom here, uh, they have like uh, this slide here, uh, Jericho. I'll talk a little about that. That's considered some of the early Neolithic type sites uh, that are kind of famous uh, that come in. Uh, like Jericho is considered really one of your first actual major human settlement uh, that you have like in world history, I guess, which dates back 10,000 BC uh, might be the time period of it. Uh, of course, modern Jericho is there. And Jericho, you know, is considered like one of the oldest town or city in the world uh, where people have been living there uh, forever. And uh, the actual ancient site uh, is often called Tel Es Sultan. That's the actual name of it. It's located in Palestine in the West Bank. Uh, I think on the western side of where uh, the modern city of Jericho is today. I think I've got an image showing the um, part of the site, uh, which is right here. And uh, they think the site uh, started out as some kind of hunter-gatherer site uh, that went back probably to the end of the uh, Pale, uh, probably into the Paleolithic Mesolithic Age, uh, and um, not a large inhabitant. I, originally, they think that the uh, site of uh, Jericho a long time ago may have had only a few thousand people living there, maybe two to three thousand originally. Uh, but over time, it became more of a farming type community uh, and um, not very large, maybe about 10 acres in size, uh, Jericho. And uh, it's called Tel Es Sultan, by the way, because it was built on some kind of artificial hill, which is called a tell, T-E-L-L. -L. Uh, and uh, they usually call it uh, Sultan's Hill, which in Arabic uh, is Tel Es Sultan. Uh, so, and uh, it's, of course, very famous. As you know, Jericho is, is you know, famous in the Bible, you know, like the walls of Jericho, which I think some think estimated went back to the time of, like, I don't know, 8,000 B.C., some people claim that the wall had been there forever, 10,000 years ago. I think there's also a tower of Jericho uh, that's also there, or it was at one point uh, as well. So you have that site, uh, considered one of the oldest, of course, uh, early Neolithic site they had. Uh, also, they have the other one I'll mention, too, uh, that's very famous, uh, which is Gepekli Tepe. I don't know if you heard of that one before. It's a very famous Neolithic site in Turkey, like the, the Republic of Turkey, uh, which was found in the 1960s. Uh, it's a Turkish name meaning pot belly hill. It's some kind of Neolithic site that they believe was a type of holy site uh, that was like a temple. Uh, so it was used for some kind of religious purposes. And uh, it's very famous for its um, megaliths. Uh, that were discovered there, I think like close to maybe 200 megaliths that actually hold up the actual building that was there. They think each one of these pillars, which you can see in the uh, picture right here, like this pillar right here in the middle, uh, weighed about 20 tons each, which I think would be equivalent to like, uh, that would be like, well, a ton is like 2,000. So what is that, 40,000 tons, 40,000 pounds, I guess, whatever. Uh, so... So, yeah, these are all different megaliths, which are right here. You can see that held up this building, which was here. And they may have, like, worshipped animals for some reason because they found, like, a lot of um, animals that were sacrificed uh, and eaten there or whatever uh, because they found, like, tons of human, tons of, like, animal bones uh, that they were there at the site. And um, it's located in southern, southern uh, Turkey, 
Uh, and um, I think it's about the size of maybe 22 acres, like the actual site of maybe where these people lived there uh, at one point. Uh, and um, so they include maybe some kind of city that was there possibly with this holy site uh, that was there at the site. But they call it Pot Belly Hill because of the shape of the hill uh, at the top of it for some reason. Uh, there's another one also in Turkey as well. They talk about the tall huyuk. You may have heard about this one. That's well known. Uh, it means in Turkish fork mound. The Turks call it later in modern Turkey. Uh, some kind of Neolithic site as well uh, where uh, apparently this site dates back to, I think both, um, like I know Kapekli Kep Tepe may have dated back as far back as maybe Jericho. I know that one's maybe like, maybe 9, 10,000 BC. Uh, I believe that uh, Katal Huyuk, maybe seven, 8,000 BC. So not quite as old compared to those other two sites I talked about. Uh, it's a 32 acre site, by the way, which may have had a population living there at one point of like close to about maybe 10,000 people at one point. They are known for their uh, mud brick huts, which that's something you see a lot in the Middle East. Uh, people making you know buildings out of mud brick and uh, their huts are unusual, by the way, because uh, if you look at the uh, picture here, uh, they had like doorways where they had like some kind of ladder or something where they would enter the house from the roof uh, instead of like a door like we do in a house, like on the side, they enter from the top of it. Uh, and uh, they were known for having uh, maybe paintings or murals, uh, maybe type fresco type paintings on the walls uh, and things like that. And uh, it is a, a very famous um, UNESCO site uh, today, which is protected by the UN. So that was pretty old, seven, 8,000 uh, BC, uh, roughly with the time period of that particular site. A lot of these later sites were later abandoned, though, apparently. Uh, there's another, I don't have a picture of, but there's one called uh, Ein Gazal, which is in modern Turkey uh, as well. Uh, that one uh, was found in the 1970s. Uh, it's in, uh, I think, near Amman, Jordan. Uh, and um, it's Arabic. Uh, it translates its meaning called Spring of the Gazelle. Uh, and um, it's pretty large. I think it's like 37 acres maybe in size. It's one of the largest ever found. Uh, they also had lived in like some kind of um, houses that are kind of similar to uh, what they had at the tall Huyuk. And, but they're known for their uh, uh, their statue art. Like a lot of their uh, uh, art depicts like human statues, I guess, of their people and things like that. So you start seeing that kind of type, types of you know, artwork being done by, by early humans. So a lot of these sites date back to like, you know, 10,000 to 7,000 BC range roughly, but a lot of them were later abandoned uh, over time. And so uh, archaeologists later found them in more modern times like mostly in the 20th century. There's other sites, you know, like Stonehenge, you may have heard of, like in England. That's more dating back to like the early, actually in the Bronze Age, like 2000 BC, a little later where that is. So, all right, let me also talk about as well, of course, we're, we're, of course we're going to be getting into later uh, to talk about the early, so I know like on, um, on Wednesday, I am going to be lecturing on, of course, Mesopotamia. I'll get into... Uh, talking about some of the early cultures that, of course, that developed there. Uh, and um, a lot of the early civilizations, the ones that kind of developed throughout the world, uh, developed around river valleys. And so hence they gave them a nickname there. They're often called the so-called river valley civilizations, which usually they call them for short, Mesopotamia, Iraq, if you want, uh, India, China, and Egypt. So that's how they break them down uh, usually. Uh, they do have long names. Like I know the one in Mesopotamia is often called the Tigris Euphrates River Valley Civilizations. Um, you know, they call it that name. Uh, but usually Mesopotamia for short, uh, which was later coined by the Greeks. I'll get to that later. Uh, India is often called the Indus Ganges River Valley uh, Civilizations, uh, which is located in uh, southern India uh, in like Pakistan. Also, Bangladesh. I think Bangladesh on the eastern side of India, uh, right there. Uh, but you got the Indus River mostly in Pakistan, and then the uh, Ganges River 
or Ganga, also got Ganga River as well, uh, which is in eastern India and part of Bangladesh. Uh, China uh, is in, of course, uh, starts mostly in East Asia uh, along the Yellow River Valley, also called the Wang Ho River. Uh, and, um, and then you have Egypt as well, of course, based in uh, northeastern Africa, North Africa, uh, based around the Nile River. So, yeah, you'll later need to know those, like the different civilizations that are there and, and of course, the river valleys uh, that are also with those particular civilizations. Uh, usually the dating of the, the river valley civilizations are usually in that order, one through four, um, Mesopotamia, the oldest, uh, followed by India. Of course, there's been a debate about which one's older, China and Egypt. I think they seem to think China is a little older uh, because they started farming a little earlier than the Egyptians did. I think there's evidence of farming going back 4,000 B.C. or maybe further back than that, like rice and other things like that. Uh, but Egypt, Egypt, you know, for a long time, I think I think up to, I want to say the uh, 1800s, like 19th century, a lot of people thought Egypt was the oldest civilization uh, in the world. Yeah, well, because, you know, because of the advancements, really the Egyptians were some of the most advanced civilizations, more advanced than the Chinese were, you know, for a long time like pyramid building and things like that. Uh, so you, you have to look at that uh, also as well. But Mesopotamia, I'll, I'll, I'll get more into, of course, that particular culture. Uh, Mesopotamia is really uh, considered to be uh, the oldest. Uh, it's where you get the Sumerians and other cultures that come in uh, that influence uh, other peoples, of course, later. So that's pretty much it uh, for my lecture on prehistory. I usually don't spend too much time on prehistory, prehistoric times. You know, that's kind of, they don't really know a whole lot about that period compared to, say, you know, later later cultures that come in, you know, like civilizations because uh, of like a lack of, you know, records. So there's no human records. Uh, usually, um, usually history starts about somewhere around three to 4,000 B.C., in that range when, you know, when the Bronze Age starts coming in, uh, which I'll start on this week. But like I said, on, on Thursday, I'll have a, I'm going to have a two-part lecture coming up on Thursday. At 10 a.m., of course, I'll first talk about like the background of Mesopotamia. I think primarily I'm going to be talking about uh, the Sumerian culture, which is the most advanced culture early on in Mesopotamia. Then I'll get into the, um, I'll have a part two lecture too, yes, tomorrow as well which will be uh, on the later part of Mesopotamia up to the time of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, like in the Babylonians and all that. So I'll have that later. So yeah, yeah Natalie, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I hope you all have a, a great rest of the week. Uh, I don't know if anybody else. Uh, yeah, the quiz will be posted. Yeah, so after you, of course, you know, watch this or if you want to go back and watch it multiple times, of course, it has been posted already, I think at 10 a.m. You want to know about that. So uh, before I go, don't forget, um, I've got a few reminders about it, but, uh, you know, the pre-test contract policy page, don't forget about that. Uh, that's due, of course, Friday. Pre-issue quiz, I think, is I want to say due next um, Wednesday. So you got a week to work on that uh, particular assignment. Uh, if anybody wants to sign up for the Veterans Project, please let me know about that. And please keep sending me uh, whatever book you want to do for your book report. Uh, just email that to me so I can add that. Uh, as of now, there's no book taken. Uh, so it's pretty much open uh, overall. So I don't know if anybody else has any other questions. I guess it doesn't look like I have any right now. Uh, but don't forget, uh, you can send me comments later, of course, you know, on my channel. Uh, if you got a comment, uh, question, of course, about this lecture. So yeah, okay. Hey, Ashley. So anyway, yeah, so thanks. So y'all have a great uh, rest of the week, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. I will send out a, uh, some kind of email probably later today uh, about upcoming lectures for tomorrow. So, so y'all take care. I'll see you, of course, tomorrow.